Yes. And uh, last week we talked about uh, doubt and we used these clay pots as a visual reminder to draw in the comparison that Paul made that we had, that we are jars of clay. And if you remember last week, they held water for a brief time until, we hit, until I hit them with a hammer, right? And as I hit it with a hammer, this one cracked and leaked out slowly. This one broke off and created quite a chasm and it leaked everything I had inside of it. It's very similar to what is going on within our lives. And you know, when we looked at doubt, there's a reason why these two sermons are connected. Because doubt is usually sitting right at the spot in which we need someone to have a defender. But doubt is simply, what we looked at was doubt is a belief in something. You know, Eve, when she began to doubt God, she shifted her belief from God into the belief in the serpent. Doubt is not where we are in a matter of unbelief. It's simply believing in the wrong thing. And we were reminded that the Lord's ability to rescue and restore our life is greater than our ability to ruin it. And that's a truth that we need to be told over and over and over again. So why do we need a defender? Because doubt usually happens when we don't think rescue is coming or it's possible. Have you been there? We need a defender because doubt happens when we don't think rescue is coming or it's possible. We're about to read a verse in Luke that gives us a, a promise that Jesus tells us that trouble is coming. And during these times, he still promises that we will endure because of him. And just like we just sang about, that the God of heaven is our defender. He is our defender. Today's one of those sermons where you're probably not going to hear a whole lot of groundbreaking scripture. It's not going to be a whole lot of spiritual truth that you've never heard before. But just like the jars of clay, it's a spiritual truth that we need to be reminded of. We need to refill our jars of clay with the word of God because we forget. And we need to be reminded of truth. Luke 21, verses 10 through 19, is a reminder of why we need a defender. Jesus said to them, nation will rise against a nation and kingdom against kingdom. And there will be earthquakes in various places, there will be famine and pestilence, and there will be terrors and great signs from heaven. But before this, they lay their hands on you and they persecute you and delivering you up to the synagogues and prisons and you will be brought before kings and governors for my namesake. This will be your opportunity to bear witness. Settle in therefore in your minds not to meditate before how to answer for I will give you a mouth and I'll give you wisdom and none of your adversaries will be able to withstand or contradict. You will be delivered up even by parents and brothers and relatives and friends, and some of you, they will put to death, and you will be hated by all for my namesake. But not a hair of your head will perish. By your endurance, you will gain your lives. You know what I love about that truth is that Jesus is saying that when your adversaries come and when wicked people, and that's what today's message is about, is what happens when wicked people persecute good people? And the idea of this good and evil, Jesus is saying, is simply this, that when you are prepared and you are, as John 15 says, when you're plugged in the vine and you stand before your adversaries, he says, I will put words in your mouth that they cannot contradict or withstand. But simply that means if we're not plugged into the vine, if we're not continually refilling our pots, if we allow what's in us to leak out and we never refill it, we stand witness to an empty pot and not to the power that God has promised us. Does that make sense? In ancient China, the people desired security from barbarians to the north. The result, the Great Wall of China. It's 30 feet tall, it's 18 feet thick and more than 1,500 miles long. I've stood on it, and I've walked it and you can do literal chariot races if you wanted to. I mean, you can drive three cars wide almost on top of the Great Wall of China. The goal was to build an absolutely impenetrable defense, too high to climb over, too thick to break down, and too long to go around. But during its first hundred years of the wall's existence, it was invaded, China was invaded three times. But it wasn't the wall's fault. The barbarians never climbed it, they never broke through it, they never went around it. They didn't have to. All they did was bribe a gatekeeper and they marched right through the door. Human nature is never the answer for ultimate protection. 
We need something better than a wall or a cave or a palace to defend us against the devil. Also, if you remember from last week, our Satan is the ultimate hunter. He studies us. He examines our weakness, and at the right moment, he pounces. And one thing from last week that I failed to mention is when a lion, you know, the, the male lion, is, he's got the best job in the entire world. All he does is roar, and then he eats. Because when he roars, the females hunt. So they literally walk in, I say walk in, they have their own communication, right? He walks in from one side of the herd and roars and every gazelle and every zebra runs away from the male lion because why would you run to the male lion, right? They run away from the male lion and they run right into the mouths of every female lion waiting to have their prey. Then the male lion just simply saunters over, takes the first eat, and then when he's done eating, then the females eat. It's not quite a modern woke society and lion I'm telling you, it's not, but it's effective, but they study their prey. A lion knows every weakness of the prey that he's about to devour. Satan studies our weaknesses. But a great point that we need to be aware of is that unlike those working those gates in the great wall, with God, we never have to worry about Satan being able to bribe God and his defenses. We become vulnerable to Satan's attacks when we rely on ourselves. As humans, we were never meant to have a defense against Satan. As you turn to Psalm 94, we're going to see why God is our defender. As you're turning, I'm going to pray. God, we love you. Lord, we thank you for your word. Thank you for the truths of Psalm 94. Thank you for the richness and the vastness and the transparency and the honesty But Lord, thank you for the wisdom that we get to get, for words that were written thousands of years ago, not even to us or about us. God, it's still true, it's still rich, it's still useful today. In your name we pray, amen. Scholars are not sure who wrote Psalm 94. There's no author listed. Maybe David wrote it, but nothing is clear enough to tell us for sure. Maybe the psalmist lived before exile. The exile was when the army took Babylon away from the Jews and those that were literally born of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, those descendants, Israelites, were taken away from Judah. Then they were made to live in Babylon and then 70 years later they came back home again and maybe the psalmist wrote it then. Psalms 93 to 99 are considered royal psalms. Since the word royal is used to describe of someone with kingship, these are called royal because God has declared our king. He is the ruler of everything. Psalm 94 itself is not a royal psalm. It stands in the middle between two sections of royal psalms. So why is it here? Because it's a message that you're going to learn today that God will destroy kings and rulers that do not obey him. And everyone will see that God is king and our only defense is for all of our enemies. So we read this passage, you'll see some of these things pop out. Verse one, 23 verses we're gonna read and then we're gonna look at just a few of them. O Lord, God of vengeance, O God of vengeance, shine forth, rise up, O judge of the earth, repay to the proud what they deserve. O Lord, how long shall the wicked, how long shall the wicked exult? They pour out their arrogant words, all the evildoers boast. They crush your people, O Lord, and afflict your heritage. They kill the widow and the sojourner and murder the fatherless. And they say, the Lord does not see, the God of Jacob does not perceive. Understand, O duelist of people, fools, when will you be wise? He who planted the ear, does he not hear? He who formed the eye, does he not see? He who disciplines the nations, does he not rebuke? He who teaches man knowledge. The Lord knows the thoughts of man, but they are of a breath. Blessed is the man whom you discipline, O Lord, and whom you teach out of your law to give him rest from days of trouble until a pit is dug for the wicked. For the Lord will not forsake his people. He will not abandon his heritage. For justice will return to the righteous, and all the upright in heart will follow it. Who rises up for me against the wicked? Who stands up for me against evildoers? If the Lord had not been my help, my soul would have lived in the land of silence. When I thought my foot slips, your steadfast love, O Lord, held me up. When the cares of my heart are many, your consolations cheer my soul. Can the wicked rulers be allied with you? Those who frame injustice by statute? 
They band together against the life of the righteous and condemn the innocent to death. But the Lord has become my stronghold. The God and my God, the rock of my refuge. He will bring back on them iniquity and wipe them out for their wickedness. The Lord our God will wipe them out. We're gonna use a very simple method today to look at these verses. When we look at passages, you, one simple way when you look at a passage is you can look at, you can observe it, you can interpret it, and you can apply it. It's the most basic method of Bible study that you can see. And as you look at this, we're going to look at a few parts that we're going to observe. We're going to interpret just a couple passages, and we're going to take one application from this passage. First, and when we observe, we're going to look and we're going to see how a psalm is split into four parts. Then we're going to look at evocative, which is just a grammar word. And then at the end, we're going to be able to see some titles of God that are used within this passage. So simply this, this psalm, you can split it into four parts. Verses one through seven is where the psalmist is asking God to do something about bad leaders. Psalms eight through 11, that short little section, tells the bad rulers that God sees what they are doing. Verses 12 through 15, the psalmist is describing life when rulers do good. In 16 through 23, the psalmist is telling us what God has done for him personally. We're going to kind of use that as a little bit of a guide as we continue to unpack this passage. But then we're also going to see some vocatives. And vocatives is a word that is just not used very often. And if you are an English teacher or a grammar nerd, then you probably understand the word vocative. But vocative is simply this. Here's the definition. It's going to excite you, I promise. It's relating to or denoting a case of nouns, pronouns, and adjectives in Latin and other languages used in addressing or invoking a person or thing. Did that light your fire or what? Right? I promise. Now, it goes on. Here's a little simpler description. Evocative is a word such as darling or sir that can be used to address someone to attract their attention. And now you're like, oh, why don't you just say that the first time? Right? You can also, with evocative, it's usually used with an imperative, a command. This is where you mention a person's name and you have another way to describe them, but you also give them a command when they're being addressed. For instance, David, come here. Hey, you, stop talking. Or if you've ever flown, you hear this wonderful vocative, sir, 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 right? I mean, it's just that the way they even say sir, I don't understand. It's like they have to go to class to figure out how to say it very derogatory, but you know immediately as soon as someone says, sir, it's like blue lights flashing in your rearview mirror. You stop, you freeze because you think it's you that you did something wrong. But all they're just trying to do is get your attention. They don't know your name. They're giving you another name in which they can identify who you are. That's what evocative is. Evocatives also, when they're used, they almost exclusively need comma separation. So I want you to look at something with me. Would you look at Psalm 94 and Aaron, you can kind of bounce, this wasn't in the notes. Psalm 94, one, where it says, O Lord, look at that, comma, God of vengeance, comma, O God of vengeance, comma, right? Verse three, O Lord, comma. You start to see this pattern as it goes. It's also in verse five and it's in verse 18. And verse 18 says, when I thought my foot slips, your steadfast love, O Lord, comma, right? This idea of this, Comma separation is giving us these ideas. These are not, these are simple names that the psalmist is using to describe God. In fact, uh, verse one, verse three, verse five, and verse 18, these are exclusive uses of the word Yahweh for God. In verse, the second one evocative that we see is also in verse one, where it's the God of vengeance. And this God of vengeance is that Elohim, it's that L version of God where the psalmist is using to describe God. And then the third one that we see is the shortened version of Yahweh, which is just simply Yah. And it's in verse 12. In verse 12, it says, blessed is a man whom you, dis who you discipline, O Lord, and whom you teach out of your law. And you see, as English, as we were just to look at this and not realize that there are different verb, uh, word forms of these particular names and titles that the psalmist is using for God, we would miss that in the English language. But you see that in the original text and they would use this and intertwine the difference between Yah and Yahweh. Yahweh, as you probably know, is the ancient Hebrew word for Lord. It stopped being said by the Hebrews out loud out of respect. But in its place, the word Adonai was used, mostly verbally in prayers. 
So that word Adonai started to come out because it was a different way where they could keep a reserved word for God. As they started to use that, then they also shortened and they found this shortened version where they would just use that form of Yah. Both forms are still found in scripture and some are being used in this passage of together in Psalm 94. Some are also even found in the same verse. Another example of this is Exodus 15, two and three. The Lord is my strength and my song. He has become my salvation. This is my God and I will praise him, my father's God and I will exalt him. The Lord is a man of war. The Lord is his name. And Yah, that form there, is used in my strength and my might. He has become my salvation. It's the shortened version of Yahweh. But Yahweh later is used in verse 3 where it says, the Lord is his name. Isaiah, when he's quoting this passage from Exodus, and in Isaiah 12, 2, he translates this and he actually includes both versions for Yah and Yahweh is my strength and my might. He has become my salvation. He's adding both forms there and almost allowing the reader whichever one they would choose to use. He gives them a choice of how they would read or how they would understand it. Psalms contains 40 instances of the shortened version of Yah for Yahweh. Titles of God used in Psalm 94, the first one we see is the God of vengeance in Psalm 94, one. The second is the judge of the earth in Psalm 94, two. The third is God of Jacob. Psalm 94, seven. First, and the fourth one is Lord, a stronghold is in, the second, is in the 22nd verse, along with God the rock. And then the final verse of the chapter, Lord our Elohim. Notice these titles are titles of power that the psalmist is assigning and describing to God. He's on the tail end and he's saying that Yahweh is the true reigning king. It's a continuation of Psalm 93, Verse one, where he says, the Lord reigns. He is robed in majesty. The Lord is robed. He has put on a strength as his belt. And I want you to notice that wherever these are, I want you to see that he is robed and it's, the psalmist is even saying it twice. He's repeating it for us because it's important to know that the Lord has been robed and why would the Lord be robed? Because he's a king. He's assigning a category, he's assigning an attribute to his king and he's given it to us twice. Well, we're gonna look at a couple of these titles as we shift into interpretation mode. Interpretation, what is vengeance? Dr. Samuel Johnson, the maker of the first English dictionary made the distinction well when he said this, revenge is an act of passion. Vengeance is an act of justice. Injuries are revenged. Crimes are avenged. See, as humans, we hear that word vengeance and we think it's retribution. We think it's an opportunity for us to pay evil for evil and vengeance in this particular situation. And even when God says vengeance is mine, he's saying, no, justice is mine. I will avenge those that are coming for you. When crimes are made, they are, that is on me. It is not on you. Said another way, revenge is a response to personal injury, while vengeance is a function of legitimate judicial authority. It's not our job to punish criminals. It's a judge's job, it's an assigned job, someone who's given the title of judge. And when the psalmist gives the title, judge of the earth to God, he's given it to him legitimately. The reason why vengeance belongs to God and not man is that in man, our emotions cause us to denigrate vengeance into revenge. Does that make sense? It's hard. We are, we are emotions wrapped in skin, emotions buried into jars of clay. It's hard to dissociate our emotion from truth sometimes. God, being the ultimate true judge, has emotion but controls every bit of it, right? That's the difference between God and man. And in 1 Peter 2, 20 through 23, he gives us this verse. For what credit is it if when you sin, you're beaten for it? You endure, but when you do good and you suffer for it and endure, this is a gracious thing in sight of God. For to this you have been called because Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example so that you might follow in his steps. 
He committed no sin, neither was deceit found in his mouth. But when he was reviled, he did not revile in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten. He continued entrusting himself to him who judges justly. Peter is assigning the same attribute to God the Father, Yahweh as the ultimate judge. He's telling us to act like Christ did when he suffered, not to seek revenge and not to pay back injustice for injustice, but rather wait on the Lord for him to bring vengeance to our oppressors. Does this mean that we don't defend ourselves? Does this mean that on this side of heaven we have no defense? We're just merely to take it? No, but what it does mean is that we use the tools and the weapons that Christ has given us. David was a minister of justice for crying out loud. He literally wiped out people groups. He used what God had given him. Those people groups had heard about Yahweh and they were still choosing to be violent to the Hebrew people. David used his army to follow the commands of the Lord and this mission as he walked on this earth But as we read last week in Psalm 24, he trusted in God alone for his victory, not his armies, not the might that God had given him. He trusted in God alone. And that is the heart of this passage. So is it proper to ask God for justice? Yes. The psalmist is asking the true king for vengeance because their people are experiencing cruelty. He asks that God's glory would shine forth And verses three through six show us why he is asking for vengeance. Why does he need a defender? Verses three through six say this. They pour out their arrogant words. All the evildoers boast. They crush your people, O Lord. They afflict your heritage. They kill the widow and the sojourner and they murder the fatherless. Notice the contrast between a wicked and a righteous person in three different ways. The first is words in verse three. The wicked uses insolent and they use arrogance and they speak of themselves highly. Spurgeon says this, words often wound more than swords. They are as hard to the heart as stones to the flesh. And these are poured forth by the ungodly and redundance. But the mark of a righteous person is humble and gracious speech. Ephesians says, let no corrupting talk come out of our mouths, but only what is good for building up as it fits the occasion that it may give grace to those that hear. Colossians 4, 6 says, let your speech be gracious, seasoned with salt, so they may know how to act and answer each person. The second way in verse four, we see his actions toward God's people. The wicked use affliction and they crush. They literally break into pieces as the NIV would say. But the mark of a righteous person is a, has a love for God's people. Romans 12, 9 and 10 says, love must be sincere. Hate what is evil, cling to what is good. Be devoted to one another. Honor one another above yourselves. John 15, 12 and 13 says, my command is this, love each other as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this than to lay down his life for his friends. Side note, most scholars believe that the psalmist is throwing shade at his own countrymen and his own people for this affliction. When he uses that word heritage, he's bringing in to the people that are aware of what is their culture. He's assigning these acts of violence. The Israelites had enough to deal with, with all the enemy countries that were surrounding them that hated them. We expect evil from those who hate us, but we shouldn't have to watch our backs from those that we know and live with. The global church for too long has been a place where we eat our young, we war and we faction with one another. We tear each other down in the name of what is right. And that needs to stop. It has no place in scripture, it has no place in the church, and has no place in the kingdom of God. The third way that we see the difference between a wicked and a righteous person, how do you respond, is the treatment of weak and defenseless people. The wicked literally killing widows, Visitors, foreigners, sojourners, and orphans. The mark of a righteous person is to love others and to give to them freely out of our abundance. Proverbs 31, 8 and 9 says, Speak up for those who cannot speak for themselves, for the rights of all who are destitute. Speak up and judge fairly. Defend the rights of the poor and needy. 
Deuteronomy 10.18 says, he executes justice for the fatherless and for the widow, and he loves the sojourner, giving him food and clothing. You see how the wicked are directly in opposition to what God stands for. James 1.27 says this, religion that is pure and undefiled before God the Father is this, to simply visit the orphans and widows in their affliction and to keep oneself unstained from the world. You see how God's word is truly opposite from the way the wicked respond. And we as a church should never be surprised when sinners sin. We should never be surprised by the depths that people go to when they don't know God because they're not driven by the Holy Spirit. Even though we're jars of clay, Paul tells us that the Son of God and the light and the power dwells within inside of us. There is no power dwelling inside of a sinful soul. That's what happens at salvation. Interpretation, simply this, God sees all. This idea, verse seven, assigns the title of God of Jacob, but it's kind of in jest. It's said from the lens of those arrogant people as they say, the Lord does not see, the God of Jacob does not perceive, meaning they don't see, he, if he really was for you, he would stop me from doing this evil action. They are the wicked killing the fatherless the foreigners and the widows, and they mock the God that does not see them or think that he doesn't understand what's going on. The psalmist uses a Job-like tone as he talks about the senses of God. He who planted the ear, does he not hear? He who formed the eye, does he not see? He who disciplines the nations, does he not rebuke? If God forms the eye, do you think he knows how the eye works? If he formed the ear and he made us be able to hear, can he not hear everything that is happening? And in conclusion, we see in verse 11 that the Lord, he knows the thoughts of man, but they are but a breath. The thoughts of man literally are like a vapor. H.C. Leopold, in his exposition of Psalms, wrote this, there has perhaps never been a more devastating demonstration of the foolish thinking which men occasionally become guilty of when they imagine that the Lord is not aware of what they're doing. God sees all. Ancient rabbis during this time said that the three best safeguards against falling into sin are to remember these three things. That there is an ear that hears everything. There is an eye that sees everything. And there's a hand that writes everything into the book of knowledge, which shall be opened at judgment. If you're listening to my voice, understand that God hears everything that you say. He sees everything that you do. And he writes everything down into that There's not a place, as David said, where we can go where God's not there. It's not just to remember and reassure us that God is always with us. It's to remind us that God is always with us as we sin. So what application can we have from all of this? Verse 19. When the cares of my heart are many, your your consolations cheer my soul. The NIV says, when anxiety was great within me, your consolation brought me. Joy is the application of struggle. Joy comes from fully trusting in the strength of Jesus. Our bodies were not designed to carry the load of worry, concern, and fear. Our bodies cannot handle a long-term burden, but God can. And not only can he handle it, he wants to handle it. And he was designed to handle it. Last week, again, James, we ended with this on purpose to set up today, and that would be this, that count it all joy, my brothers, in James 1, verses two through four, and count that joy, my brother, when you meet trials of various kinds, for you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness, and that steadfastness have its full effect, that you may be perfect, complete, lacking in nothing. And brother and sister, as you're going through your trials and you're going through your tribulations, it's not to, to slide them over out of the way. It's not a put on a happy Jesus sticker and just smile. No, what James is saying is consider it joy because your testing is going to give you something that you can't get anywhere else, and that is steadfastness. And that God desires to work in your heart and your mind to create in you someone that is perfect and complete but it has to happen in a struggle. 
Joy comes in the morning is a promise found in Psalm 30 verse 5. It isn't because King David knew magically that every fear in the morning would disappear and in the morning every burden would go away and in the morning every enemy would be vanquished. No, it was rather because another day that God was at work for him. That's trust. No night lasts forever. The sun will always rise. And with the dawn comes this, a new day with a new blessing, with new favor of a heavenly father that's hard at work for us to bless us, to strengthen us, to deliver us. David had seen this time and time again. Life may not be perfect, it may not be comfortable, And it's rarely free of pain and rarely free of struggle, even for the most faithful servant of God. But in the midst of our pain, in the midst of our uncertainty, in the midst of our fear, God is always with us and he's always working for us. When God is our defense, it brings us joy, even in our uncertain circumstance. Today, as you see, there's, you may not be able to see it very well, but there is a chess set. And this chess set is made of miniature terracotta army. If you're familiar, we started this message with a description of the Great Wall of China. That Great Wall of China was built by Emperor King Shi Huang. He was the first emperor of China. He unified that wall. That wall was built into many sections, and this was in the third century B.C., But these men, I say that loosely, these statues of men were found in 1974. They were put into the ground in third century BC. They were found by local farmers. The figures vary in height according to their roles, the tallest being generals, and the figures include warriors, chariots, and horses. Estimates are anywhere from four to six feet tall for these men. 2007, there were three pits found holding terracotta army statues. They held 8,000 soldiers, 130 chariots, 520 horses, and 150 cavalry horses. The majority, which remained buried in the pits in, in Huang's mausoleum. The emperor was a, an accomplished leader in his day. He ruled the area after uniting provinces from all over the region and he expanded the land that formed what is still known today as China. He was known for uniting the language and currency and connecting and finishing the Great Wall and establishing a national identity as well. Things were going pretty well for him until he suffered through his third assassination attempt. By the third deliberate attempt on his life, King's mental state started to shift. He started to obsess with the afterlife and he started to obsess with defense in the afterlife. He was a great warrior and a great emperor and a ruler on this side of earth and he wanted to be a great ruler and emperor in the afterlife. So he hired 700,000 workers to start building something underground that no one knew about. He accomplished something that was pretty massive. 38 square miles of a mausoleum underground. And in these pits were ornate brick lined floors, waterproof ceilings and walls and wood beams. And they were just a small part of that 38 square mile mausoleum that just simply held a dead emperor. The tomb would end up measuring that distance and it was holding in that amount an army It had a palace, it had stables, and it even had a pyramid, all underground. And it laid there for thousands of years, until 1971, someone's digging in a farm that collapses, and imagine his surprise when they pull dirt back and they see a massive statue army that no one even knew existed. King's fear of the unknown consumed his life, and his hopes had degraded to the point where he no longer trusted in man but he literally started to trust in clay. He had faith that his clay army would protect him. 
but his faith was unfounded. Clay can never defend against anything. A toddler can break a clay pot. With a Fisher Price toy, can throw something at clay and it will break. It's weak. It was never meant to withstand pressure. It was only meant to hold something. You put something of value in a clay pot and you use the clay pot because if it breaks, it can be replaced. Clay can never defend anything, let alone a terracotta army. In a battle like this set out on a chess, both sides would literally smash each other into pieces. It would be a worthless war because neither of these were designed for that. And we look on this side of history and we see there's no way a terracotta army could defend him in the afterlife. But how many times do we use unfounded faith and put our hopes and trust in something just as silly as a terracotta army? Our jars of clay were never meant to withstand the forces of evil. I wanna leave you with this. We were never meant to defend. We were always meant to depend. Verse 20 through 23 says this, can wicked rulers be aligned with you? Those who frame injustice by statute, they band together against the life of the righteous and they condemn the innocent to death. But the Lord has become my stronghold and my God, the rock of my refuge. If Ken Juan had known about that verse, if he had been able to claim God is his refuge, his world would look a lot different. His afterlife would look a lot different. His mental state on this side of earth could look a lot different. But David knew that he could depend on the deliverance and the defense of the Lord. He had seen it time and time again and he knew he would do it again. And just like we just sang, you fight for me, you always have, you always have. My victory is in your hands, in your hands. The God of heaven is my defense. Christian music does get a bad name when things get repeated. But just know, sometimes hymns and songs are simply just using a poetic device found in scripture. Or sometimes we as jars of clay need to be reminded time and time again. I love the orderly nature that scripture, when it's put together this way, in the beginning of Psalm 94, we're told twice that God is the God of vengeance and it's repeated to us. And then at the end of the Psalm, the psalmist tells us that God will bring final iniquity back on the wicked and we're given that statement twice that he will wipe them out. Terracotta armies and human defenses will never defend us against Satan. Can you say like the psalmist, the Lord has become your stronghold and your rock, the God of your refuge? Let's pray. Father, we love you. Lord, we thank you.